Hey, trucked up guys and gals. Thought we'd have a little candid conversation about a lot of the FUD that I'm constantly hearing about uh, an electric truck. There might be a kernel of truth to absolutely every single thing that you've heard negative about EV trucks, but it's not the norm. It's the exception to the rule. I'm gonna put a caveat on that. You've gotta have the right environment up front to own an EV truck, just like you have to have the right environment to own a gas truck, or you have to have the right in environment, let's say you're on a farm to have a tractor, or you have to have the right equipment to be able to use a snowmobile. So all of those things have things attached to them. An EV truck is not a gas truck. They operate differently. You gotta do things differently. So let's talk about a couple of those things and put some stuff to rest. First, if you're going to have an EV, doesn't matter if it's a truck, a Chevy Bolt, a Nissan Leaf, an Ionic 5, a Lucid or a Tesla, one of the most important things that you'll discover is you really need to have a charging unit at home, especially where I live, because right now it's, I got my gloves off <laughs> to film this. It's minus three, it's not exactly, you know, uh, lovely temperature here. So you hear all the FUD, first of all, about the cold. So let's just address that right off the start. Over on the side of the house, there is a NEMA 1450 outlet. Cost me a few hundred bucks to have an electrician come up and just basically run a cable off of my electrical box, my electrical panel, put in a 50 amp breaker and ran it up to this. And then I plug in my level two charger that came with my Ford. And then I simply plug in my truck overnight when I get home. God, I'd like to have those gloves on right now. Uh, and I wake up in the morning. Hello, truck just woke up because I'm walking up to it with my keys. But it's just charging right now. Even if it's not charging, it's doing a lot of things. And this is really, really important, folks. If you have an electric truck and it's cold and you wake up and you look outside your house and you see frost and mountains and snow, if you're not plugged in, your batteries are as cold as it is outside. Well, not quite, but they're cold. So the thing that this is doing right now is it's keeping those batteries conditioned. So you can see that those blue lights aren't flashing right now, they're just blue. That means it's still doing something, but it's not charging, it's conditioning. So when I leave in the morning to go to work with this truck, all of the things about, oh, you're gonna have so many problems, you're gonna get stranded. If you live in a city, and if you live in an apartment, if you live in a condo, if you live on a street where there's no availability to put a charger in your house and be able to run that charging cord to your vehicle, maybe an EV truck isn't gonna work for you because that's just a reality of having an EV. There's my wife's Bolt. It's been parked overnight, not plugged in, and she's still got about 150 to 200 miles of range. I'm trying to convert my head from kilometers. She's got about 300 kilometers of range when she wakes up in the morning. And what we do is we swap the vehicles out depending on who's gonna use what in the morning. Now, a lot of people have garages or they'll have a second plug, and then they can just have both vehicles plugged in overnight. This is important if you're going to own an EV. The reality is that truck behind you I simply get in it at minus three, minus 10, minus 20, whatever the temperature is, and I press a button and it goes. There's no crank, there's no turning over of a motor, there's no viscosity issues with the oil or the fluids in the vehicle, none of that. There's no block heater, it's ready to go. Your range will be impacted. So I'm averaging about with, it's not so much the battery because I precondition, it's more because of the way I use the heating and air conditioning and heated seats and heated steering wheel and stereo and all those things that really drain the battery out more so. But I'm finding in the winter about 30% less on average, even in the real cold snap that we had that you all experienced both in Canada and the United States. I never had to worry about it because of what I use my truck for. If you are driving great distances on a regular basis, if that truck bed is full of material every day, 
because of the job that you do. And you're having to drive that material over 100 miles there and back every day. Then an EV truck probably isn't going to work for you. If you're needing to hook up on the back of that truck a trailer on a regular basis and you have to pull that trailer more than 150, 200 miles every day, then an EV truck is likely not going to work for you. But in every other scenario, which is most of us, 87% of us who own a truck are not using a truck as a truck. I am. I use my truck every day, but it's short haul work that this truck does. But if you are the average truck owner, you're going to take one to two trips a year, not a month, not a week. And 87% of individuals who own a pickup truck, these are statistics. This is from the Bureau of Highways. It's also from Axios Research Studies. All show the same thing is well over 80% of truck owners use it for errands and shopping. They never use a truck for anything other than that. Only 7% of light duty pickup truck owners use their truck for towing. Only 22% of truck owners ever haul anything significant in their truck other than going to Home Depot and picking up a couple two by fours. All possible with an EV truck. So that's FUD. That's just fear, uncertainty, and doubt about a truck without actually knowing the facts. Let's move on. Batteries. Let's talk about batteries for a moment. We hear all kinds of horror stories about batteries. So the first thing is, what happens if your batteries start on fire? Well, that's probably not a good day, but battery fires are incredibly rare. You've heard all kinds of stories because it's clickbait. It works very well to get the news outlet some views and helps their advertisers out to get a dramatic story out. But here's the reality. Do you know that it's eight times more likely that your gas vehicle will start on fire than one of these. That's a fact. Here's the excuse you'll hear a lot on this one. I can hear it already in the comments. Oh, well, that's because it's far less EVs on the road. No, this is per thousand units. This is a percentage. So based on the percentage, the number of gas vehicles that are on the road and the number of EVs that are on the road per thousand, you have eight times more chance of your vehicle blowing up and starting on fire with gas. So yeah, they do have issues, but nowhere near what we're already driving on the road. There's some serious FUD that needs to be busted. On that note, battery packs and how expensive they are and how screwed you are if anything ever goes wrong with them. So if the batteries go in this F-150 Lightning and I have to replace the entire battery pack, it's going to be about twenty, twenty-two thousand dollars $22,000. Now, what's the likelihood of that happening while I own this truck? Well, first of all, when I bought this truck, it came with a 180,000 kilometer, so about 120,000 mile warranty on those batteries for the next eight years. And not only is it on the battery, it's on those electric motors, two motors, all covered. And I got an extended package on mine, so I extended that warranty even further. But here's another reality. Ford was thinking ahead. Those packs underneath are modular, which means if there's something wrong with a part of the battery pack, they take out that module, which means the chances of you ever having to replace the whole battery is slim to zip. Now, other manufacturers, I will say, Ionic, I believe, uh, five that you've heard about, the pack is all one glued mass. A lot of Teslas are one glued mass. They can't just take out a portion of the battery and pull it out because the battery packs in many of them now are structural. So they're not done in units. GM, however, with the Ultium batteries are modular. So if anything happens with any particular part of the battery, they just take out that module and replace it. So you're talking about a fraction of all the FUD that's been pumped out about batteries. It's a load of garbage. Here it is. We don't have any statistical information over the past 10, 15 years that indicates battery costs are any higher in any way whatsoever than regular internal combustion vehicles. So when you hear this, take it with a grain of salt. When you hear all the stories about the Ionic 5 and the $60,000 battery in Canada and what went wrong, and when you actually investigate that story, you realize that it's a load of bunk. Let's just get down to it and accept the fact that a lot of this stuff is just clickbait. And if you can take a look deeper 
into actually what's happening with these batteries, they're just improving. They're getting denser, they're traveling more distance, and, and just improving as far as how they operate in the cold. And on that note, let's deal with one other issue directly related to the F-150 Lightning. Remember that I mentioned that I use the heater a lot. I'm a wimp. I like to get in a truck that's very toasty. Is that the case for everybody? No, if you want to be really efficient with this thing in the middle of the winter, you can be. You can just use your seat heaters and your steering wheel and turn it on really low, and your range isn't impacted anywhere near the levels that I'm talking about. So maybe 20, 25% in some of the worst case scenarios. But here's something else. Ford has already tapped into a major improvement with this truck, and it came from Tesla. Thank you, Tesla, regarding heat pumps and the octave valve. Brilliant breakthrough. But Ford went further and created a new patent on something called the Vapor Injected Heat Pump. I'm no engineer, I have no idea what that means. It is one of the most efficient heat pump systems available for any vehicle in the world. And they really put a lot of research into this. And they're able to make it highly more efficient as far as heat transfer within the vehicle. So they're able to take heat from the batteries and move it into air conditioning. They're able to basically circulate and utilize all the heat generated in the vehicle for everything else that you need. And it's done so well that they've dramatically improved the winter efficiency in this vehicle in 2024. Now mine is a 2023. I get the resistance heating. But now, already, in one model year, we've seen a profound change to the efficiency of these vehicles in the winter. Here's some more FUD for you. These things are doomed. Ford's pulling back. They're gonna get rid of these things. They're done for. EVs are over. Hybrid's where it's at. Incorrect. In fact, sales went up 53% year over year from 2022 to 2023, and Ford is forecasting that they'll far surpass that in 2024. Demand is growing for the vehicles. They're just not growing at the level that everyone planned on. The S-curve that everyone talks about is how fast adoption takes place. So you get this low rise and then zoom goes up, and that's your S-curve to full maturity of the market. Well, that's happening later than anticipated with trucks. Not so much with Tesla, for example, not so much with SUVs. As we know, the number one selling vehicle on the planet is the Model Y. So, mm, yeah, can't make much, much of a case on that. But demand isn't growing at the rate that everyone forecast. So what Ford did is they went in anticipating this massive growth rate built out huge factories, started putting everything together to meet that demand, and then the demand, which was growing, just never reached the levels that they had anticipated, so they pulled back until they see those levels happen. In fact, its replacement is on the way. And I guarantee you that when that happens, the efficiencies that we're seeing now in the first generation of these trucks, it's gonna be profoundly improved. So all the FUD, about these things vanishing is total garbage. They're not vanishing. They're not going anywhere. They're being adopted. People are using them when they're realizing how much money they're saving. And there's another one. You're gonna go bankrupt if you own one of these. Now we've already talked about the batteries, but they're so inefficient. How long are they gonna last? Electricity costs are gonna kill you. Uh, yeah, no. Let's take a look, shall we? So this house is charging this truck. And what rate do I pay? Well, that's getting better and better by the day. Where I live, BC Hydro is about to introduce this June an overnight rate that's half, or about 60% of the day rate. So if you charge in the low rate rather than the peak rate, you're paying eight cents a kilowatt hour. Oh yeah, absolutely mental. Right now, I'm paying around 14 cents a kilowatt hour. Before I had a Ford Ranger, four liter, 2007, and I used that thing for work and just abused the heck out of it. Brilliant truck, loved it. An older vehicle, internal combustion vehicle, as it ages, becomes less and less efficient. We hear all about battery degradation becoming less and less efficient. We have Model S's on the road that still have 80% efficiency in their batteries that are approaching a million miles of use. So yeah, let's see how that goes over time. Looks like they're standing up much better than internal combustion. But back to the point of cost. Here we have a vehicle that before when I had a Ranger parked here, 
I woke up, had to crank it over, sometimes had problems when it was super cold, and off I went to work and I filled it up with gas. And to drive over 400 kilometers, so it did about a 400 to 420 kilometers on a tank of gas, because it was getting pretty bad. It was a four liter in the cold, didn't do well at all. That cost me 100 to $105 here in Canada. Now, the same distance traveled with this truck is costing me currently about six bucks. When the rate drops, it's gonna cost me four. That's pretty easy math. And here's another piece of FUD for you. You're gonna puncture the batteries. If you go over anything, any bump, you're gonna rip the batteries out of thing. You're doomed, you're done for. No, you're not. Not in this truck. Maybe in the Cybertruck, I've heard some real horror stories about what's actually underneath those. When T-Sportline crawled underneath the Cybertruck, they said there was no armor plating. Um, I'll put the video link below. I'm not quite sure about that one. I think they may have designed it right into the battery pack itself, but it didn't look very promising compared to what I've got underneath this truck. You're not going to puncture the battery in an F-150 Lightning. Ford went way over the top, maybe over-engineered this one. I'm happy about it. It's got more armor plating underneath the F-150 Lightning than a Ford Bronco. Yeah, the entire underbelly of this truck from the two motors right across the entire skateboard battery pack is armored. A big, huge sheet of armor plating. And not only is it thick, and not only is it rigid, and not only has it been designed as a very effective skid plate in how it's got its grooves and its contours placed underneath, it's got a gap between it and the actual battery pack, which means if you hit a boulder at high speeds, <laughs> you're probably not going to even reach the battery pack because of how they designed it. So that's just total FUD, people. It's a load of garbage. And here's the other thing. The battery pack underneath that armor plating, it's plated. They don't want you to have problems with these things. They want you to be happy with these things. Well, it's warmed up beautifully. It's gone from very, very cold to very warm. It's absolutely fantastic. And on that note, I can talk a little about where I am. As you can see in the background, I'm standing here at Slocan Lake. I'm in the middle of the Selkirks and the Kootenays. It's an absolutely beautiful part of the world. But for that other piece of FUD, people always talk about is, these are urban vehicles. The F-150 Lightnings are all about, in fact, all EV trucks are nothing but urban vehicles. To go to Walmart or Home Depot and pick up a two by four and then go shopping. But they're never actually used as work trucks. Well, mine's a work truck. And every day, in this tiny little village, I get up and I go to work in that truck. And I never have to think about it. I never have to deal with all of the things people say are a problem with these trucks. Not once. Um, charging, I charge at home. Get up, go to work, do short haul. I use my trailer, I use the bed. It's constantly full of debris. It's going back and forth to the transfer stations with dump runs. So there's a lot of FUD all about what these things can or cannot do. The reality is they can do almost as much as any other truck, just not the distance. You can't be doing major long haul towing. You can't be doing long haul pulling of a fifth wheel or a trailer, and you can't make huge trips without having to charge on the way. But that infrastructure is there, just not very fast. That's something we do need to see improve dramatically right across North America. But as far as getting the job done, I live in a village that has a population of 200 people. And in an upcoming episode, I'm gonna be visiting a farmer who uses his truck exclusively as a farm truck, his F-150 Lightning. And I'll be visiting a metal artist who does his work remotely with an arc welder uh, doing metal art with his truck, powering all of that in remote locations. And I'll also be dealing with a gentleman who spends a lot of his time inside wilderness zones on forestry service roads on a regular basis with his lightning and never having a problem with it either. There's a lot of FUD folks about these things not measuring up. The reality is most truck owners aren't doing the truck things that people constantly talk about these things not being able to do. For 80% of anybody who has a pickup truck today, an EV truck can do exactly what they're doing now. Try your best to avoid the FUD. Look into the research yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it. 
do the research yourself, take them out for a drive, see what you think of the things, and then think about your own situation and how you use them. And if it doesn't work for you, don't get one. Get a hybrid, get an EcoBoost, or just get a diesel or gas truck if that's what you need it for. It's about application. I just want to thank you in advance for helping my tiny little channel out. I'm trying to get to 1,000 subscribers, and I really want you to come along for the ride in those future episodes. This tiny channel is trying to do a lot of big things, and it requires your help. I really appreciate all the comments and all the support I'm getting already. Thank you again for watching. We'll talk to you soon.